A case study. In 1989, the Vernonia School District in Oregon enacted a suspicionless drug testing policy for all interscholastic athletes. Parents of one student, James Acton, sued the school system on the grounds that the drug testing violated 12-year-old James' rights against unreasonable search and seizure laws. They argued that James had never shown any signs of drug use, and the school had no reason to suspect he used drugs. The district court upheld the school's actions, but the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the case, stating that the boys' rights had been violated. The case then made its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1995, the U.S. Supreme Court decided 6-3 to three that the drug testing did not, in fact, violate the boys' Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment rights. The court weighed the boys' right to privacy against the school system's legitimate interests. The court said that as minors being forced to attend school by law, students have less Fourth Amendment protection than adults. The decision made it clear and legal for schools to randomly test all athletes. Many schools across the nation made drug testing mandatory for student-athletes. In 2002, the law was challenged when Lindsay Earls and Daniel James, participants in non-athletic extracurricular activities, claimed that because they were not athletes, and because the school system of Tecumseh failed to identify a real drug problem, their rights were violated. The U.S. Supreme Court found in favor of the school system, delivering an opinion that stated that students did not lose their rights when entering a schoolhouse but that their rights were different in public schools, and that school systems had the greater interest in order to provide a safe, healthy, and disciplined environment for all students. How does the Supreme Court decide which court cases to rule on? Just because someone appeals a case doesn't mean the Supreme Court has to review the case. What do you think the court considers when they determine which cases to rule on and which cases they will let the lower rulings stand? Some of the principles the court uses for deciding whether to review a case include Standing. Does the appellant have standing to challenge the law? In order to challenge a law in the Supreme Court, someone must be able to show they are directly affected by the law in some way. For example, someone who believed that capital punishment was a violation of our protections against cruel and unusual punishment couldn't challenge the law on that alone. They would need to be directly affected by the law. For example, being on death row themselves or possibly being a family member of someone sentenced to death. Moot. Is the law moot? The conflict must be live in order to be resolved by the court, if the conflict has already been solved. Example a criminal was pardoned by the president, the case is moot and is no longer a matter for the federal courts. Constitutionality, does the case even involve a constitutional claim? If the arguments presented to the court don't involve any claim of a constitutional violation, the court would have to decline the case. Categories of law. Branches of government. Even though we live in a free country, rules still govern our behaviors. You probably already know that it is against the rules of society to kill someone or steal their belongings. Rules, known as laws, help keep the population in order. Think about what society would be like if we had no laws governing how we should act. Although it might sound like fun, laws help keep society functioning better and more efficiently. Imagine how chaotic life would be if you couldn't leave your house because someone else might move in. Without order, there can be no freedom as someone else's freedom could easily infringe on another individual's. Laws exist to ensure that everyone has the same privileges and the same responsibilities. Before we learn how laws are made, it is important to know that there are several different kinds of law. When we talk about how laws are made, it all starts with the Constitution. The U.S. Constitution lays out a plan for the government that makes, accepts, and evaluates our laws. It does this by establishing three branches of government. These three branches of government govern on three different levels in the United States. Local. State. Federal. Federalism is the system that allows federal and state governments to rule over the same area, but the higher level of government can negate rulings of the lower level of government. The state has the power to nullify any local laws or ordinances it deems inappropriate, while the federal government can do the same to the state laws. For example, if a state decided to outlaw cell phones, the federal government could step in and overrule the state law. This is done through each level of the government's court systems. Local governments, state legislatures, and the federal government all make laws, although laws made by the federal government are the only ones that everyone in the nation has to follow. Local Level 
the local often city or county legislatures create local ordinances. Some ordinances include noise laws that restrict the amount of noise allowed in a neighborhood, a weight limit of vehicles on certain roads, and whether or not you must keep your dog on a leash when outside. Another increasingly common ordinance is the banning of skateboards and roller blades in public parking lots. State level. State laws have a larger impact. State legislatures are responsible for most of the laws that a person lives by. They set speed limits, define what are criminal acts, and regulate areas of a person's life like health insurance, unemployment, welfare, and education. Some examples of state laws include high school graduation requirements, driver's licensing regulations, and seat belt laws. Federal level. Federal laws are wider spread. They cover all people who are United States citizens and citizens of any U.S. territories. They set tax rates and regulate international commerce, education, and health care. Some examples of federal laws include the legal drinking age, voting age, anti-discrimination laws, and anti-treason laws. At the federal level, we have three branches of government involved in the lawmaking process. Legislative branch, writes the laws, House and Senate, also known collectively as Congress. Executive branch, accepts or denies the laws, President. Judicial branch, upholds the Constitution in our laws, Supreme Court. From proposals to law, becoming a law. With so many levels of laws and regulations, how does an idea become a law? A very clear process exists on the federal level. Ideas for new laws are typically introduced to the formal lawmaking process in the House of Representatives, one of the two bodies in the legislative branch. First, a representative makes a proposal that can be either a senator or a House representative. A proposal is a formal idea put before the governing body for consideration. The representative describes the purpose of their proposal, its relevancy, and what is necessary for it to be successful. For example, if we were a representative, we might propose that the United States should cut its greenhouse gas emissions by a certain percentage over the next five years. It is then drafted into a bill, or a new piece of legislation that has not been made law yet. The representative then introduces a bill to Congress by placing it in the hopper, a small drawer on the legislative clerk's desk. Once a bill is introduced, it is numbered and then sent to the appropriate committee. Committees are much smaller groups of congressmen and women who are in charge of certain types of bills, including the drafting, refining, and approving of what they consider relevant legislation. There are committees that handle matters related to the country's budget, the armed forces, education, health care, labor, and agriculture. Many more handle other areas of our country's legislation. Our greenhouse gas emissions bill might get sent to a committee that deals with bills on the environment. Committees act like small legislatures. They examine different aspects of the bill and vote on whether to send it along to the full Congress or not. If a bill gains a committee's approval, it's placed on the calendar to be considered. The calendar lists all the bills Congress will be addressing. It can include voting, committees, and bills. Our emissions bill would have to be approved by the committee and passed on to either the House of Representatives or the Senate in order to make it onto the calendar.